Hello, hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Why People Do What They Do, where we speak to talented and accomplished individuals from various fields. Now, today um, we have a very special hello, guest hello, with us. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another and episode of Why People I would like to give a shout out before that. Before we begin, I would like to give a shout out to our friends over at Peace in a Pod. Peace in a Pod is a podcast that interviews Princeton students about their unique perspectives, passions, pursuits, and other peace. By having open and honest conversations with various Princeton students, Peace in a Pod hopes to promote student discourse on salient or overlooked issues, uplift college students' voices beyond an elite institutional brand, and provide a peek into the student generation and the complex world of higher education. Season three of Peace in a Pod has just launched and links to all listening platforms can be found at Peace in a Pod at Buzzsprout.com. You can also follow Peace in a Pod on Instagram at Peace in a Pod. That's P S in a Pod, P O D, Peace in a Pod, where you can participate in their poll and playlist series and on Twitter at Peace in a Pod Network. So, guys, go check it out. Go listen to their podcast, Peace in a Pod. I would like to introduce our guest uh, for this episode episode of Why People Do What They Do, Suraya Zainuddin. She is a writer, speaker, and digital marketer. She's also the founder of the personal finance blog, ringgitoringgit.com, and she's also the curator of the book series called Money Stories from Malaysians. Suraya, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Yes. Okay, I'm going to put on my earphones right now. Okay, Soraya, you have been running your personal finance blog, Ringgit or Ringgit.com, for over five years now? Yes, yeah? correct. Wow. Tell us how you got started in this space. What inspired this idea to start this blog? It wasn't intentional in the beginning. I mm. was looking, I was trying to make a living as a freelance writer, and okay. it wasn't even something that I wanted, that I knew I wanted to do full time. So, what happened was I was trying to find work I was submitting my resume submitting my CV and I wasn't getting any great offers um, okay. and in the meantime I thought okay you know what let's make some side income by freelance writing so I thought I was submitting guest articles here and there I was doing projects and then I thought you know what why don't I make a website and then I put sample articles in there and I was supplemented with my favorite topic which is personal finance and I just kind of grew from there and when audience started coming in I thought in my head oh crap I should give them a better user experience and I just kept on adding on um, mm. more articles, um, better team, better um, optimization, and it just really grew from there. But why personal finance as a topic? When you were um, a freelance writer, were you focusing mainly on financial topics? Um, were you a finance grad? Share with us how you, how you got started, how you got interested in this particular topic. A lot of people ask me why I got interested in personal finance and the simplest way for me to answer that and also the most honest way for me to answer that is simply I love money and <laughs> no shame you know what there's yes. a lot of shame around it. ah money is this thing that will corrupt your life but once you accept it once you know that you can't live without it once you realize that it's the tool for you to enable the life that you want to live mm. then it becomes a whole other world of opportunity opportunity of growth of um, self-development right mm -hmm. so it is within that frames and mindset that I started exploring the world of personal finance and even before Ringgit or Ringgit I was already writing about personal finance um, I just didn't know it so before Ringgit or Ringgit I had a website called um, chickenflossbun.com uh, which died because of technical errors anyway and before that I was already sharing about personal finance on Tumblr and that was going on for years so what happened was me moving from being an anonymous writer to a blogger so that was the only shift and you know what like writing about day-to-day -day money I'm just writing about what I find enjoyable um, and I'm guessing that's why people 
came and people visit and they no longer want to read about money in the quote unquote like boring way what the feedback the kind of feedback that I've gotten is that oh Suraya your content is relatable your content is um, easy to understand and I'm always glad when people see these things because oh yay you found it fun like I do mm. and now it has become a community and now I have amazing people who are also passionate in this thing that I didn't know people were passionate in so as much as Ringgit or Ringgit has been an avenue for me to earn money mm. it has also been a great source of joy and fulfillment and belonging that sense of community has mm. been amazing what I find very charming, um, you also mentioned earlier, you know, your audience come up to you sometimes and say that, you know, you make it so relatable for them. It's something that they can resonate with, right? People want to know what they can do with their money. They also want to know relevant information. But what I find so charming is that you share with them your personal finance journey. They know and you put you laid out there for everyone to read what you spend on. Was that a difficult decision to come to when you started your blog? Because, you know, coming from, you know, Asian background, background um there's always a case like okay for me for example you know i uh, come from a fairly traditional background you know where people don't necessarily talk about money you know you don't talk about how much you earn you don't talk about how much you save because they're they're perceived as very private information is it the same for you well the again honest answer to that is I didn't expect people would read it. <laughs> I was writing it for myself. I was writing it as a way for clients to see, ah, okay, this girl can write as okay. a work portfolio. I didn't expect people would come in and read about why I buy onions in a supermarket. <laughs> I, I didn't know you found it fun. But once I knew that that's what people were into, I'm like, okay, let's go. Let's go with this. <laughs> I found my niche in the market. All right. Um, how, no, how, how, um, how far in were you um, writing content and running your blog? Did you realize that, oh, okay, my blog is actually gaining traction? It was within the first year itself. Um, the fun. first year coincided with... I gained a lot of traction in the first year and for one very specific reason. Um, I was one of the early adopters of cryptocurrencies during that time in Malaysia and I was recording my journey in buying cryptocurrencies including all the mistakes I was making during that time. Yeah, It's not just like um, I was telling people a lot of um, things that were not necessarily like good decisions, things I regret but I was also one among the first people among the first financial bloggers who were covering it in terms of like adding and de deciding to like embrace it, right? So I wrote a couple of guides and then it just, traffic just skyrocketed um, and it, it just never left. <laughs> <laughs> what, what are the other topics that um, your mm. audience are very keen to, to know about other okay. than currency? Mm. Um, I, I, okay, Generally speaking, there are maybe like four different types of big angles, maybe five. Um, so saving money in general, earning money in general, mm -hmm. um, investing money in general, and also money management, right? But the additional ones, I would kind of lump it under lifestyle. And mm -hmm. that is the whole where I think the, the, the gap exists the one that kind of differentiates me from other writers from mm -hmm. other bloggers um which is the the way that i choose to approach um financial management so again like taking it as a learning opportunity um trying and i explore themes like is it even ethical to hoard money in the pandemic mm. right i even explore themes like the guilt that I feel as a Malay Muslim living in Malaysia, knowing that we get a lot of um, um, uh, privileges, yet the disappointment that still a lot of people with the same racial background are still financially disadvantaged. So what went wrong? Mm -hmm. I explored themes like, how is it? How is dating like as mm -hmm. a um, as a person who, as uh, you know, I, I don't want to be a cheapskate in mm -hmm. in dating in the process like finding a, a life partner so how is that how does money shape my dating life yeah. so it's 
it's lifestyle, yes, mm. but the intersection with between lifestyle and and personal finance, mm. I think, has been the reason why people kept coming back to my opinion pieces. Yeah. And are all these pieces mostly your opinion, or do you speak to friends, family, focus groups to get you know inspiration from these topics? How how is your process of writing like? How long does it take for you to write a uh, research an article, write an article? Your creative process like? Sorry, I didn't get that. Can you repeat? Oh, um, how is the process like for you? Um, how long do you research for or develop an article? Um, is it mostly your opinions and research or do you have focus groups that you speak to or your friends and family? How is the process like for you? Okay, um, generally speaking, there are two ways of writing articles. Mm-hmm. One, you tap into conversations that people are already interested in and they're already high search interest. So you write articles based on what people are already interested in. So these mm-hmm. would be things like investments tends to be really, really popular. Mm-hmm. Um, and things like, um, generally speaking, like different ways to make money are also very popular topics. And I try to balance that with the opinion pieces that has always been um, are not particularly like um, uh, like SEO friendly. Mm. Maybe people don't even know that they want to read things like that. Mm. But I try to balance both of them. So what are people already like looking for and okay. what I feel like writing. So um, it's always a balance. And the process, but the process is more or less the same. So I bring them everything <laughs> in Google document and then I will edit it for SEO article. So right. the okay. process, uh, in case any one of you are interested, this will be kind of like under the umbrella of um, um, being a blogger or like earning money through blogging and have articles about how to write articles, how to structure it so that um, it you can write articles for freelancing or things like that mm. so you're, you're a very structured writer you put all your ideas into a google document you plan it all out as opposed to you know some writers they will have um a blank canvas on microsoft word and then they just start typing and then they see where the hours bring them so you're more structured in that mm. sense is it i think i'm a combination of both like once okay. in a while like things come out from the subconscious that yes <laughs> I follow the, uh, there are uh, some writers who actually describe this process. They are like, for the good thoughts to come out, you must let the bad thoughts come out first, right? And I love that because Mm. I would like write and write and write and write and then delete everything and then Mm. rewrite them. Mm. And that's when all the like, the deepest, I wouldn't say darkest, but like the deepest um, things come out. Oh, okay, like the deepest reflection and, and yes, things like that. Thank you. Mm, yeah. Okay. Well, when do you normally write, Soraya? Do you, are you a morning person? Are you a morning writer? Afternoon, evening, or you're a night owl? I I have no idea. <laughs> That's a good <laughs> question. Uh, again, I think I'm a mix. Okay. Um, I don't know how to answer that. It's, nice. it's so really you're, a mix. You're, you're, you're basically, you can write any time of the day. I, or yes, I haven't pretty, figured out yeah, my, my own. <laughs> now, you've been very um, open and honest about how Ringgit or Ringgit has opened many doors for you. You've got uh, varied opportunities and it has opened um, avenues like uh, consulting, speaking, right? And writing, writing for clients as well, content development for clients. When did all these other opportunities start rolling in? Um, share with us as well, how were the early days like when you were writing for the blog? I know you shared with us already um, how you started the blog because you you were writing for yourself and for, you know, like a creative um, canvas for your thoughts to flow through. Mm. How were the early days like? And when did the opportunity start rolling in? It came almost immediately, to be honest. Wow. Yeah, it, it was amazing. And again, I think that I'm just lucky I was mm. at the right place at the right time um, uh, uh, you know filling in a gap that I didn't even know was a gap mm. so I generally think that I got lucky and what, it, what happened was I wrote the articles I shared it people liked it people reached out people offered opportunities mm. um, obviously it has been great 
a variety of opportunities that came my way, like what you said, consultancy opportunities, um, writing, speaking, moderating, and it's been great with it. in terms of it really satisfies my my desire for variety of activities, yeah. even within like the personal finance space. Mm. So you do a varied amount of work right now, right? With um, you know, still sticking to ring it or ring it, you know, creating content for that platform, but also having this other opportunities. How does a day in a life, a day in the life of Suraya Zainuddin look like right now? Um, do you still write as many articles for the platform? How do you split? Because there's just so many blocks, you know, of time that you have, and we only have a finite amount of hours in a day. So how do you do that? So I think that. Generally speaking, I have three big chunks mm. in my life: uh, personal projects, um, client projects, and uh, personal development. Voluntary okay. work would include under personal development, mm. and uh, the personal projects are things like things that are related to the website and projects I want to do. The book series, Money Stories from Malaysians came from there. Um, and it's basically like, how do I want to creatively interpret personal finance and create different things based mm. on my whims pretty much. Mm. But um, that's one part of it. The client part is really depends on what the client wants to do. And part of the work is trying to figure out what the client wants um, and try and deliver that in the way that is suitable for them. Um, under personal development, that actually fits a lot into the um, into the the work. Mm -hmm. These are things like, well, currently right now I have invested a lot in courses. So it is throughout my self development journey that I figure out new ways of re. Uh, reframing personal finance almost. For example, I'm taking a course called um, Happier with Gretchen Rubin. And I love Gretchen Rubin. I love yeah, her. Too. I read her books and I listen to her podcast sometimes. Yes. Yeah. I, did I did you read her. the Four Tendencies? I did, yes. Yeah. And I also read um, The Happiness Project. The Happiness Project as well, correct. So it's called The Happiness Project Experiment. It's a one year course. Uh, technically, it starts next year, but I already like did some of it. So I have already nice. completed my part of the work for January is to make a 21 for 2021 list, right? So I have already made my 21 for 2021. It includes some financial stuff as well. And it okay. took me like over a week to come up with all 21. It wasn't like a, the first mm. five was easy. Okay, make how much, you know, like do this, do that. And then you start to like, okay, what else? do I want to do this year? And the goal mm -hmm. is not to hit everything, mm -hmm. but as long as you have things that you want to strive towards and, and to to look back on and like, ah, this is as a reminder that this is the things that you set, you set out to do, mm -hmm. then that's, that's enough. So that I will turn into an article, right? That so, is, oh gosh, mm -hmm. I, I can't wait to read that. Yeah. Ah, great. And you know things like that, right? It really, you know, when you when you join courses like that, or you know, Gretchen Rubin's course, I had to talk to you more about that um, yeah. later on. But you know, things like that really, you have to delve deep into yourself, and you have to reflect and really think about what exactly do you want in the next five years of your life or in the next year. Yeah, so it, it really takes a lot of self awareness and a lot of of work. Right. I, I think I'm a self-awareness junkie. Uh, <laughs> I, I love personality quizzes. Yeah. I love um, emotional, what do you call it? EQ, emotional um, emotional awareness exercises. Um, I love reading about like how the mind works and all that. And mm -hmm. it's, it's just fascinating to see, again, like the overlaps of how does money is obviously such a big part in every everyone's yeah. life right but how how does it again how does it intersect like in what yeah. way do I allow money run my life instead of mm. using it or oh, how different personalities money. also have you know yes. different relationships with money yes right? yes yes wow. yes 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 so um recently one of one of the questions that was posted in the in this same group is which do you value more saving money or saving time 
and that See, made I don't me know that question. I don't even know the answer to that question. Right, right. Yeah. So I was like, yeah, of course, saving time. Wait, what do I? Because I just spent. Mm. I know today is twelve twelve, and I just spent <laughs> how many hours looking for the best deals for something that I wanted to get. So <laughs> in the time, if I had just I bought it, I could have mm. used at least like one working day to work on like personal projects that could have earned me money. But then again, I do enjoy the bargain hunting element of it. And then my head goes, but Suraya, you enjoy deal hunting and yeah. enjoying something for the sake of enjoying it. It's not wasting time. But then it goes back again, but you could have used that time so much better. So it's always like, like a, I'm still figuring it out. So... Yeah, and that's something that I want to ask you, right? Um, mm-hmm. You know, you are so deeply invested right now in all these courses, uh, personal development, um, you know, your happiness journey. Where do people strike that balance between happiness, time, and money? Mm-hmm. And, you know, different people have different relationships with money. Um, yes. Some have, um, some are very deep in debt, um, but pe- other people are very frugal, but they don't necessarily enjoy luxury items. They want to, but they are very frugal because, you know, they're overly frugal sometimes. Um, I want to keep this amount of money for rainy days. So where, where is that sweet spot? How, where, where mm-hmm. does that, where is that balance and how do we strike that balance? Mm-hmm. Uh, this, uh, this, fall, this question is tricky to answer. It falls into two big themes. One is privilege, right? Mm. One is like, you can afford to, to spend a little bit more, but you just don't want to because something is holding you back. Or, mm. Right? That's the element of privilege is definitely there. Yeah. Um, and I completely understand when people who are financially struggling, they feel a lot of... Um, uh, they feel that all the, you know, like saving money advice out there is don't have like I completely get it. Mm. Um, so that's one side of it. But the other side of it is the money scripts that we grew up with. Money script is a relatively new term that I just learned um, earlier this year. So money scripts are things that you have grown up believing about money which you learn from your environment and you have subconsciously accepted as a way of life or a way of living okay. not realizing that there are other there are other ways of reframing those thoughts mm. so one example of money script will be the thing that you um, you have mentioned which is um, being overly frugal Mm. Uh, bordering on cheap I was hello queen of street uh, <laughs> I would no 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 kidding I would like like I spend five minutes looking at two different types of onions seeing which one is more cost effective okay right to that extent like a, a trip to the grocery store was, would I would take like three hours to mm. complete one round uh, but then again during that time I was a um, student I was studying and I was um, trying to save as much money as possible. So I wasn't, that's something I couldn't to, afford. Yeah, that's something to be applauded though, don't you think? Like, you know, you, you, when you are a fresh grad or even a student, being frugal is something that, I don't know, wouldn't it be better to be frugal than say millennials these days that would that are overly spendthrift perhaps? I would challenge that. I think that rather than framing them as um, this spendthrift generation. Mm. One is all of us are hopelessly um, defenseless against ever, ever growing effects of sales and marketing initiatives. Mm, that's true. Yes. Right? Right? Yes. So if you're bombarded by ads every single oh, yeah. day and they use sales I, 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 against yes. you. Yeah you're going to fall sometimes. Mm-hmm. You're going to get into like one moment of weakness when you're not feeling good about yourself, bam, you bought a lipstick, mm-hmm. right? That happens so much. I wouldn't even call that a spendthrift. I would just call that like you, just you wanting a little bit of joy in your life, which you could solve with money, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, there should be a limit. Lah. And mm-hmm. here I'm not talking to someone who's like, genuinely having a, a shopping addiction. That's not what I'm, what I'm referring to at all. Mm-hmm. People who have that problem have that problem. Mm-hmm. But for like normal everyday people, mm-hmm. right? we can't 
blame ourselves for falling into all of this um, targeted ads towards us. Who knows exactly what time we're online. Marketing yeah. technology is ridiculous, right? I have to consciously like, you know, click, you know, the X button just to get those mm. ads out of the way. <laughs> yeah. But another side of it is, and this everyone knows and can agree with me, the fact that we are not having the, we are horribly underpaid. So yeah. <laughs> we are horribly underpaid and if you adjust our salaries to the current uh, to what we should be receiving, then whatever that we are spending mm. is well within our means with enough to spare for um, savings, for retirement, for whatever. Mm. Right. So the it whatever that we have right now, this 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 thing that we are living in it has created a cycle of just compounding scarcity mindset for everyone. Mm. Not just we are being told that, hey, you're not saving money enough. You don't have enough in your retirement. You're not, you're not so good. You're not disciplined. If only you're doing more, 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 mm. right? And then the other, uh, and then and you, and you keep thinking, ah, yes, I have to save more. I have to do more. Um, but in order to do more, I have to like sacrifice um, time with my family, time with my friends. It creates such a scarcity mindset that is so mm. hard to break out of. Yeah. And being poor is already hard to begin with. And it's, it creates a cycle of poverty. And I don't have an answer to how we can solve all this. <laughs> Obviously, it's a compounded um, issue that no one thing to blame no one thing can solve mm-hmm. um, but I guess it is my job to tell people that hey please don't blame yourself mm-hmm. like like so many people are you know giving you like shame based advice so many yeah. people are be kind to yourself remember that you're only human if you fall for another sale it's okay pick yourself back out um and generally speaking be in an environment where it's a lot more encouraging Mm. and and accepting and doesn't (laughs) (laughs) i call it like that so yeah Based on your experience, you know, developing content, talking to people, um, you you also curated, you know, the, the stories of you know Malaysians and their and their money stories. Where, what is the quantum of a person's salary? Do you think is um, the sweet spot in saving? How much do you think a person should save from what they're earning? Uh, um, well, oh, you think it varies? No, it. Uh, of course, it varies, mm-hmm. right? There is the number of person in the household. Yeah, uh, it is the number of dependents that, that a person has. Um, I I personally have no dependents um, yet. Uh, my parents are, you know, de- depending on they have their own retirement money. Yeah. I have friends my age, or, or even when we were we were younger, we were still same age in, in uni. They were already supporting their siblings, their younger siblings' yeah. education. Mm-hmm. So that's what we're talking about. That's mm. totally not fair. Not not yeah. totally not fair. There's, that's, no, there's no that's the way it is. answer for everything. Yeah. Correct. There's not right answer for everything. But having said that, um, uh, one bench line, one imperfect bench line that we can go based on is the EPF punya. Um, they came up with like the living wage, um, what they call it, living wage guideline. A single person needs roughly around, living in Klang Valley with no dependent needs roughly around like 2,700 ringgit in order to survive. Mm-hmm. Um that number is still low. When those numbers came out, when the suggestions when the suggestions came out, people were actually like quite angry at EPR saying that, oh, that's nowhere near enough because of this cost, this cost, this cost, this cost, right? Mm-hmm. Um I, I think that the sweet spot definitely comes with the, the lifestyle that doesn't um that doesn't apani, uh sacrifice health and safety. Mm-hmm. And gives you like a nice, um, at least like 20% savings rate, that would be the sweet spot. So mm. if you can survive with like, let's say, like 1,000 ringgit per month and you're earning 1,200, then you can save that 200. That's still considered your sweet spot. Mm. That's kind of like a like a long shot figure and not really applicable for many of us. But that, technically speaking, theoretically speaking, it can work. Mm. Um, it's cost of living 
and savings rate. Those two things. Let's go back to your the, the process of your work, right? What yeah. would you enjoy most about your work, Suraya? You've been you've been doing this for over five years now. What is that one area that you uh, that keeps you going every day? Mm. I I genuinely love I love love I love my work and uh, it gives me a lot of opportunities to be grateful mm-hmm. and to also learn. So as mentioned, a lot of things that I do in my for my own self development comes back and translates back into the work. And whenever someone comments back and say like, oh, I never realized that we can look at this from this angle, mm-hmm. that gives me so much satisfaction to show people that, hey, this can be approached in this particular way and not necessarily the negative way that they have always been told. That gives me a lot of satisfaction. Um, the other satisfactory part is, of course, the fact that I don't have a boss I'm Mm self-employed that comes with its own headaches uh, Mm -hmm. which keeps me up at night but that's another story but the point is I can I don't use alarms every single day Um, Mm -hmm. I wake up when I wake up I finish my work when I finish my work Um, some (laughs) again sometimes that that's a bad thing rather than a good thing but Generally speaking, the flexibility has been so amazing for my mental health. Mm. Um, I, c- I can really see it translate into my physical health as well. Like back when I was employed, mm. um, I was sick every like three, two, three, four months. Something happened. Like I was, I had fever or I had a like cough or something. But touch wood, I haven't been sick in five years. I don't think that's a coincidence. Mm. Mm. I think that's something that many people can relate to, right? Um, mm. There's so much conversations going on about the work-life balance. Mm. You know, there, there is no such thing or it's, you know, people people are striving towards work-life balance, but it's very hard to, to strike that. Some people are even say like, there is no such thing as work-life balance, right? Oh yeah, there's no such thing. There's no such thing as work-life balance. <laughs> Something has always got to give. Yeah. Um, but, you know, going back to what you what you were saying about working for yourself, you know, there are so many people right now that are freelancing. What would your advice be to them? Um, are there certain uh, advice or tips and tricks that you can share with, you know, freelance writers out there? Okay. Um, I... I personally, I'm still figuring it out. So I don't think it's my place to, to give advice even. Um, I did write an article about I angled it in a way that's like what I would advise my younger self so if any of you want to read that you can go ahead and look for like um, that article in ringyoringyo.com but generally speaking I believe in the whole concept of explore widely Mm. and then figure out not just what you like but also what you don't like Mm. do more of what you like uh, do less of what you don't like or Mm. outsource them and that is the recipe that is the formula for a happy life 80% of the time you can't get 100% of the time that's quite impossible Mm -hmm. but 80% of the time doable was that the reason why you decided to you know freelance um, do freelance writing because you were falling sick most of the time when you were employed um, was that always the plan to be your own boss or oh god no yeah no. <laughs> so it was accidental How, what, it was completely accidental yeah, tell, I, tell us about that we didn't touch about that yeah. earlier well I was during that time being employed was all I knew mm. I was doing freelance writing on the side while still sending out my resume right still hoping to get a job but I was really getting really bad offers Mm. I was sitting in a really bad like interviews with people who I knew I I don't want them to be my superiors so I had the extreme privilege of having savings during that time which afforded me time to keep looking and keep exploring and it was through that time that I got that all this happened and opportunities came in and I just never stopped. Mm. That was literally it. I think, again, it was like 
roughly around six months or maybe about like a year after it and then I was just like ah I don't have to sign up my resumes anymore I guess this is my full time work now it it just never really um, that realization that I'm not going back into the workforce didn't come until fairly late into the blogging into the blogging mm, okay yeah. Mm. So, so it's been four years last since you've updated your your resume, <laughs> yeah. which is a good thing, right? Is you've been doing well, you know, opportunities keep rolling in. Yeah, I I want to say that yes, I've I've been doing well, but also mm. I've been spending more than I'm earning for the last couple of years. Mm. Um, again, extreme privilege to have saved more in my earlier years of freelancing when the. I, I saved the majority of my um, income during that time. Nowadays, I'm just full on like self development, self development. Um, uh, uh, um, re- just reinvesting in bank into into myself mm-hmm. and into my family. So I know that I am I'm, again like I'm a. If if you're looking at it from this way, I'm a bad financial blogger. I'm spending more than, and I'm completely okay with sharing that. But it's only because I'm financially comfortable enough to pursue. Mm-hmm reinvesting everything into into mm. my life yeah you're also the curator of this book series called money stories from malaysians you recently published volume two congratulations now tell yes. us about uh, tell us more about the curation and the publishing process of this series yes so i wanted to write a book mm. Uh, I couldn't force myself to write like a whole book. So I decided to do a competition, a short story competition and made it into a community thing okay. and compile the selected stories into a book. So I did the competition, I compiled it, I self-edited, I self-published mm-hmm. and then I pitched it to bookstores and happily um, bookstores nationwide now carries both Mal- um, Malaysian stories wait hold on money stories from Malaysians volume 1 and volume 2 in the whole of Malaysia so you can find it in Napish in Kinakonia in um, popular um, in Times bookstore um, the big bookstore all carry it so I we've been extremely lucky to to have that opportunity so it's been very receptive from the community eh? Yes, it is. It is. And also it's because of the angle. Like, I'm very clear that I didn't want to give out um, a book about financial advice. That okay. wasn't the purpose at all. If people want financial advice, they can find financial advice. It's not because of lack of resources. But what people want is relatability. Mm-hmm. What people want is a way, a new way of looking at money in a way, a new perspective that they haven't discovered before. Mm-hmm. So you have all of these like strange, strange stories. Like my personally, my story is a reimagination. In the first book, my story is a reimagination of um, not a reimagination, but like a, an alternative reality if Malaysia implements universal basic income and how mm-hmm. a person who is living in that time would react to it so it's like a dystopian story um they just wanted to see how people push the 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 theme of personal finance to the most extreme ends of their imagination beyond i save this much therefore i am financially stable Mm -hmm. like i was very clear that i didn't want to go that right Okay, Dom and I are actually going to um, talk to you about getting a signed copy from you after the show. <laughs> um, we also have a comment from Jawhari Ali. He says Shopee put other, so Shopee is also carrying <laughs> a book. Okay, you've got a you've got a follower here. I'm sure he's a, a follower of Ringgit or Ringgit.com. Jawhari is one of the um, authors in Money Stories Volume oh, One. Hi, Jawhari. Nice. Yeah. Now his his story is an amazing one. It made me it made me cry. Oh, okay. Is that something from Jahari himself or his yes. family? Right. Yes, his okay. family. So guys, it's his relationship with his daughter. It's a really heartwarming story. No joke. No joke. Volume one? Yes. Okay. So guys, you have to go and get volume one, volume two, if you want to hear stories from Jahari or and other contributors from this book series that uh, um, Suraya has curated. Um, so, uh, Soraya, I also want to touch base with you. Um, you know, we recently talked about millennials. Um, yes. Let's talk about what ch- 
challenges millennials are facing in the hi cat <laughs> what's it name this is lemon hi lemon welcome to you the just show just jumped up yes <laughs> <laughs> okay. so, um, millennials, millennials, yes. millennials, what are the challenges uh, that you think millennials are facing when it comes to money these days? Um, you know, you you mentioned earlier that we are underpaid. What our what the boomers were getting um, years ago, we are also earning similar to what the boomers were earning, or even less because of inflation. So let's talk about what millennials are. What what challenges millennials are facing, and how can they overcome it? Okay, we have covered the 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 fact that they are <laughs> very closely targeted by ads, by marketing and mm. um, sales initiatives. Completely undeniable. Completely happens, um, and it is especially dangerous when all these companies now they they are using. Um, what do you call it like that talents and KOLs and all of that so people who they trust in mm-hmm. order to sell products okay. um, and I do this as well so this is super meta mm-hmm. and that is the reason why they want to get like certain products or certain services anyway th- that's one of it the other one again is undeniably because not earning enough mm-hmm. um, the third one which is definitely something that I want to address right now which is information overload combined with trust issues so there are plenty of people who have especially when they start their financial journey right they would of course like what's your financial journey you will google certain stuff yeah. right yeah. and then you will see the ads and the financial gurus and all of the different platforms all promising you ways to get more money more income they would they in the beginning stages of a person's financial journey they have no idea who is trustworthy who is not it is only i would say like by i guess luck that they would manage to avoid certain bad scenarios happening to themselves when i speak to people my age it is extremely common for people to have lose money in ponzi schemes in scheme to part career in mlm in in um you know following like like certain um, courses that use high pressure sales tactics mm. extremely extremely common and I feel that it is during that exploration stage that people are so defenseless um, but this on its own is not a problem if not for the trust issue that we have to authority figures here in Malaysia I don't want to comment too much about what's contributing to that it's probably a combination of like politics and leadership and that's beyond whatever that we can um, control. Um, it's probably also due to the delivery method that they have been giving out. Again, it it might be you know due to like the shame based advice that that is just happening. Um, the fact that people are so unwilling to share financial mistakes because netizens are so mean online. Mm. Uh, so it's a combination of of all of these things, right? Mm. And a lot of people have financial mistakes, but we don't really hear them so publicly up until recently now that people are more open about sharing about them. Mm. And, and even so... Why do you think people are more open now? I think people are more open now. Well, uh, one, there are like viral websites, so that serves as a good avenue. Mm. Um, I don't know if you know about this one Facebook group. It's called um, Kisa Rumah Tangga. Right, and Kisah Rumah Tangga is kind of infamous for being a place where um, spouses would complain about their other half, and then um, they it, the comments can be again like weird and 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 mean, mm-hmm. but as part of the comments, you can also see things like, oh, that's why you must do insurance. Oh, that's why you must do uh, estate planning. Oh, that's why you, uh, you know, women should have their own savings. Mm-hmm. Interestingly, it is these kind of like, I don't want to say it's whisper network, but it is this like informal groups mm-hmm. that make people more inclined to take financial um uh, approaches that work with their life. It is due to these, um, you know, mistakes that people make, which could be, you know, love mistakes or anything like that. But 
it became almost like a moral story for them. Like, ah, yes, of course, I have to keep a separate account that mm-hmm. I can access in case anything happens because my partner is abusive towards me and the kids. In case anything happens, I can go somewhere safe. Mm-hmm. So, it is this avenues I, I feel that helps a lot in financial literacy indirectly. So, again, it's all about making it relatable. So, rather than saying you should save 10% of your um, income, twenty percent mm. of your income is so well, like clinical, mm. right? Not, it's completely correct advice, but it's also not. It's it's just a number, mm. and when you make it back home, like it suddenly gives you a reason. Ah, I should do it. I should save this amount because this money reflects means safety for myself and my children. So, so money, that money equals control over money your life, equals right? freedom money yeah. equals safety money equals choice yeah. money equals less stress mm-hmm. so it gives people meaning and this is one of the good reasons about social media we keep complaining about like, social media being half a society and whatever mm-hmm. but it is also I believe because of these anecdotes that people realize the importance of prevention I think mm. that's a good one Thanks for that. Um, you also mentioned earlier about, um, you know, people losing money from money games, um, following certain um, schemes online. I want to also discuss with you about this, you know, online phenomenon about financial or business gurus or people who brand themselves as experts in certain fields. Um mm. You know, many people from different age groups, be it millennials, even though there's a big chunk of millennials that are very inclined to follow mm. these groups or advise from these financial gurus. What was your take on this? Um, why do you think people are just so inclined to be influenced by this sort of um, lifestyle and advice? They have amazing sales psychology. That It's as simple as that. You found them, you find that their content relatable. Uh, I, I don't know how often you go to, to to their seminars or, you know, to their webinars, but it's it's a formula and uh, it will go like, it can be from anything from Forex to drop shipping to um, earning money from, uh, from blogging, from um, investing in the in the in art pieces to the stock market yeah. it can be varied mm. but the formula is more or less the same mm. so they would offer you a free webinar or an extremely cheap seminar mm-hmm. and then they would they would have they would just give you like a little bit of like enough and then they will have like a big chunk of it which essentially boils down to if you love your family you would do this for them they play that game. That is the mm. reason why I say high pressure sales tactics work. Mm. And then it would go into the, the closing, right? Mm. Then all of the, um, if you get it today, you can get it for the cheap price of 5000 instead of mm. 20000 And they try to upsell you this amount of, mm. of, of items. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. 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 Um, and, that in itself, see, I have nothing against people who, who sell courses. Mm. But I do think it is extremely predatory if they encourage people to participate using credit cards. Mm. Mm. And if they specifically target people from low-income, yeah. low-household communities. So, mm. extremely predatory. You want to sell courses? Go ahead. Go and target the T5. Go and target the T20. Mm. I don't care. But once you do it, to people who don't have money mm-hmm. once you tell them that you can fund this through personal loan or credit cards then yeah. that's where all hell just mm. Mm. have you ever had that kind of experience from family friends or even your audience coming to you and saying that they have you know fallen victim to this sort of um, schemes or seminars or courses mm. audience yes definitely yeah. um Family, I think I have a couple of family members who are mm. part of um, MLMs, um, but we don't really share that 
like openly yep. um, see here's the thing like people rarely do things for themselves mm. it's always you know the the amazing picture that have been planted in your head like if you do this you get to have to create a better life for your family is that fantasy that they're selling mm. that is extremely hard to get out of and when this kind of messaging comes from you know people who look like you who speak like you or even like your, your community leaders people from the surau or people from the kampung teachers right we we think that oh this only affects like people who maybe have like less education but this happens to people who are extremely rich by mm. all account they are they, they are educated this happens mm-hmm. to educated people mm-hmm. so i get i think like a part of the work that i do also one also kind of like goes around like tame your ego don't think that it won't happen to you mm-hmm. because once you're once you think that this advice is not applicable to you that's when you are more susceptible and be super weak and won't be able to absorb any more new mm. knowledge. Okay, so never say never. Mm. Mm. I don't want to say like never. Yes, that's just one of the phrases that I love to use. Mm. In this particular case, just uh, there are, don't think that this is something that you are immune to. Right. And again, like this is not just something that I see happening a lot with, um, I, have, I, I don't know. It's it's something that happens a lot. Um, when people see someone falling to like scams or like, oh, you know, they, uh, they don't know enough. That's why they fall to scams. Mm. When, pe- when people see news about people who can't service their car payments, right? Mm. It's a sad situation. And then they go like, oh, you know, like they don't, they want to compare themselves to like, their, um, they want to look rich. That's why they, they, they buy this like luxury cars mm. and, and you know spend over their means you know like they are like so stupid like padan muka they cannot they get into like bad situation you that is like all of this like there's gonna have like you are so good with your finances that other people are bad that's a really 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 bad mentality to be in mm. and I think in my work I like to say like look I have been doing this for like so many years. I'm still making shit ton of financial mistakes. I just admitted earlier mm-hmm. that I'm spending more than I earn. I'm making a financial mistake. I'm going to admit it. Um, and don't think that you are doing everything perfectly. Perfection mm-hmm. is is impossible in the first place. Yeah. So quit the judgment, right? Mm. Maybe me saying that is quick yeah. to judge as well. So yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, what What is your philosophy on money, Soraya? Mm. it changes um, now it is something that enables personal growth mm. um, I want to say that I'm happy with my financial situation but still I don't feel content and I can't figure out why or what's the reason for this discontent mm. so I read an article recently about how we are addicted to the culture of self-improvement. So that's another one that just kind of shook my head a little bit. Oh, I am... If I'm constantly in the road to self-improvement, that must mean that what I am right now is not good enough. Mm. Am I not good enough? So that makes you feel that you are... All of the things like having imposter syndrome... Mm. Um, uh, feeling inadequate even though people are you know wanting to to work with you so um I still I'm still struggling with a lot of things um and I can't answer all of them so let's see what happens after this one year happiness project maybe I have answers for you yeah I definitely need to talk to you about the happiness project I'm definitely a yeah. fan of Gretchen Rubin um yeah. you, you've also you you talk about um self-improvement um you you are also consistent in your uh, blog posts about how you are not a financial advisor um, and you recently spoke about your imposter syndrome and that's why you decided to embark on um, getting your certified financial planner court, um, certification, right? How is that going so far? I had my first class today. <laughs> so I learned about insurance, y'all. <laughs> 
how long does it take to to complete the CFP course? I think the you mentioned that in your article. Yeah. Yes, the fastest possible way is around one year. Mm. Wow. Okay. So mm. that, that's going to be a very busy 2021 for you, eh? Yes, <laughs> that's one of the one of the goals that I'm setting myself. For yeah. This year. Hmm. What's next after you get your CFP? I have no idea. I'll say this. <laughs> <laughs> you, no, okay, a lot of things. I, can I just say something to yeah. all of people out there who's like, don't know what you want to do, right? Yes. I think it's a common myth that people, unless you're extremely fortunate that you have mm-hmm. found your purpose like early in life, yeah, I want to be a doctor and save people. Okay, fine, good. I I didn't know I wanted to be, maybe even up till now, I don't, I don't, now in hindsight, ah, okay, now I can tell, say mm. to you that, yes, I'm a writer, I'm a blogger, personal finance blogger, I do this, I do that. But it is only in, in hindsight that that all of this happened. I didn't really have a destination. I'm not particularly ambitious and I think that's okay. I surround myself with a lot of people who are ambitious um, and they have, you know, extremely amazing plans on how to double their wealth, on how to earn um, millions of ringgit and good for them. And I think that I have went through the process of that, but I don't desire that. Mm. So I thought about like bringing ringgit or ringgit to the next level, you know, making it into a media company. And I'm just thinking, but I really like my life now. So is it about earning more money or is it about making being happy with where I'm now so yeah. these are all questions I'm still exploring mm. but what I can say is that I'm not particularly ambitious and that's okay mm. I love that honesty um, because you know so many people um, our age um, they, they have that pressure to you know have everything figured out um, mm. you know I have had that conversations with friends also who are like you know um, I'm not married yet is it is it bad you know based on society's demands that I am not married I don't have children so you know there's all of these questions but at the end of the day um, I think what in a nutshell it all boils down to the fact that we are all in the business of figuring things out mm. yeah and it's a journey really mm. um, if anything this year 2020 has taught us so many things right and um we are living in definitely um, unprecedented times. So many people are, you know, having their own relationships, different relationships with money. But what we can learn is that we can live, we, the human race can live on very little or on basic needs. What, from this pandemic um, or 2020 as a whole, right, Suraya, what are the um, revelations on money that you can share with the audience? Um, Things that 2020 has taught you? You can't rely on the government. Mm. Unfortunately, you can't. um, I I believe that Malaysia is a rich country, uh, but there are, um, but the money is concentrated on a few. This touches on wealth inequality, which is another topic I'm very passionate about. But the money is concentrated on the few and is not nearly going to where it should be going. Um, financial safety nets in the form of um, education, infrastructure, roads, um, medical are getting more and more taken away from people rather than being added on. Childcare services have have, um, have suffered and the result of that is less women joining the, the workforce. So at the end of the day, you can pressure the government. Of course, it is the, the obligation for, for every citizen to demand more uh, more accountability on the government. But ultimately, it is um, all up to yourself and your community and the people around you to support each other. And... If I can put it in a hashtag, it is literally kita jaga kita. Kita jaga kita. Mm. What's next for you? Um, what are the projects you're currently working on or you would like to work on in the future? Um, I I would. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I am battling my own limiting belief. I want to do a course or okay. workbook for the longest time. And uh, I have my own limiting belief. Like I don't know if what I'm going to produce is valuable enough for people to um, to spend money on. I don't know if it's going to be beneficial for people. I, I I have a lot of that limiting um, that I know I know I'm good, but I don't know if I'm good enough that people should like, give money on. Writing articles for free is completely fine, right? Because it's free for people; they can access it anytime. But asking people to pay. Mm. is something that I'm always, always, always afraid. So that's why a lot of my income right now comes from not the audience, but comes from clients who I work with. Mm. 
Mm. In fact, maybe like this year, maybe the direct income coming from the year ringgit orders is maybe 10% out of everything that I earn. Okay. Mm. Right. Well, it's going to definitely keep you busy. And I'm sure if you present something to your audience, they would be more than willing to tell you what they want. So you've got your <laughs> CFP certification. Am I saying that right? Yes, CFP yeah. certification. Um, then you've got, you know, your happiness project um, for 2021 with Gretchen Rubin and um, this plans that you have, which you aren't sure of, but I'm sure your audience will love it and they'll be receptive towards. So good luck with that. Um, yeah, fingers crossed. We're keeping our fingers crossed for you too. <laughs> Um, Soraya, you know, you talked about, you know, you starting out, you were employed and then you wanted to go into freelance writing. Now, Malaysians in general, right, uh, writing and speaking well are some of the traits that are so important in the workforce. But not many people are necessarily good at that or it's something that they are working towards in refining and polishing. Um, what would you say we would need to do in order to hone these skills? And what would your advice be for young people to write and express their thoughts confidently, um, coherently, you know, in a concise manner, precise manner? Okay. It, uh, well, it, you have to to get quality, you have to go through quantity. Say so, again. Sorry? To get to quality, mm. you have to you have to go through quantity. Okay. So and this is not an original thought, yeah. This is like mm. what I'm condensing from like various um uh writers out there, but various people, authors out there. And pro- producing a lot of work mm. is will even though it's crap in your head will be the reason why your work will be good. Because again, you have published so much bad or, or mediocre that there's no choice for your brain to come up with something good. Mm. You have already exhausted everything that is like on the shallow level kind of like uh, analysis that you have no, that it has no choice but to go like deeper, deeper, mm. deeper, deeper, deeper. So go through the quantity. Mm. If, you, if you are a writer like I am, then um, I personally write two articles per week. Um, some people go like daily writing challenges. You can go through that. Um, people do free writing exercises where they just write through anything and everything. They just process it in their head for, for, you know, like a good 20 minutes. And you will never, like the first few minutes will be easy. And then it will just be, you'll just find it like, and then later when you're finished the exercise, you read back like, oh, I can't believe I wrote that. It, <laughs> it was in my head. You will go to that moment, those moments. And these examples are not just limited to, to writers. Mm-hmm. Even um, there are countless examples where the one main trait of successful artists, whether it's like painters, sculptors, musicians, right? Is the fact that they produce a lot of work. So some of those work are bound to be good. Mm. So go through the quality. Go through quantity to get quality. Go through quantity in order to get to quality. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Thanks for that. (laughs) Soraya, thank you so much um, for being with us here today. Um, I I definitely had a lot of fun speaking to you. Um, People can follow your personal finance blog at uh, ringgitoringgit.com, guys. Go over to uh, ringgitoringgit.com to see more of what Soraya develops, um, writes for all you guys. Tell us where people can find out more about you on your social media handle, Soraya. Can you find you on Instagram? I know you're on Instagram. Yes. Twitter? Yes. You also produce videos on YouTube, right? I do. Yeah. You, you have done the work for me. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> find Soraya on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube and head over to ringgitoringgit.com for content on personal finance. Thank you. Thank you so much, Soraya. Thank Take you care. so much, everyone. Yes, Thank have you, everyone. Day for watching another episode of Why People Do What They Do. Um, If you like content that we develop for you, please head over to WPDWTD.com. We are also on Facebook. We live stream on Facebook. We are on YouTube and we are on Spotify as well. Till then, till next time, guys. Thank you so much and stay safe. Bye.